You're listening to Opera Innovations, a podcast brought to you by ABA Technologies. This month on Thought Leaders, we are talking with Dr. Scott Geller as he describes how he got into the field of behavior analysis, behavior-based safety, and ultimately started actively caring for people. We're talking with Dr. Scott Geller today on our Thought Leader series, and I'm very excited to hear this, but I'm going to pass it to him and he, and hopefully he'll be able to tell us, you know, his history with the field and how he got to where he is today. Thank you, Shauna. Let me start by saying when I speak to students and their parents at Virginia Tech, and this, this is my 50th year. I've just completed my 50th year and I'm still here. And I tell my students that I hope for them that they would get to appreciate what I have appreciated, that when you go to college, when you go to universities, find yourself, find what you enjoy, what gives you purpose. And quite frankly, that's why I'm still here, because I still see purpose and value in what I'm doing. So let me get way back, you know? I was, I was, um, I was, I, 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 and <laughs> my dad was a, was a medical doctor, my mother was a nurse, and I thought all my life I wanted to be a doctor. And when people asked me back in elementary school even, what are you gonna do? What do you wanna do when you grow up, Scott? And I would always say, I'm not sure, but I wanna make a difference. And then as well, you gotta stay, stay in school and you gotta get educated and, and now I'm in high school. And so what do you wanna do, Scott, when you grow up? And I said, huh, I'm not sure, perhaps medicine, because my dad is a doctor, but I, I'm, I wanna make a difference. And then they say, well, if you wanna make a difference, you gotta go to college, you gotta get an education. So now I'm at the College of Worcester um, in Worcester, Ohio, a small school. Um, I'm grateful for going to that small school because I tell you what, we didn't we didn't have multiple choice tests. <coughs> Excuse me, we learned how to write. We filled out exams, discussion exams, but it was a smaller school, and and again, always concerned. What do I want to do? And again, when I tell my students this story, I don't tell them this story. But when I say, when you're in college, just find what appeals to you. So I'm thinking pre-med, I'm thinking medicine, but psychology appealed to me. So I ended up majoring in psychology. And now I was in an awkward situation kind of like, because now I'm a senior, you know, I did pretty well. And, and now I did have to decide, do I want to go to graduate school and follow up psychology, or do I want to go to med school and be like my dad? Well, it turned out that med school was gonna be very costly. And I had a scholarship, research scholarship, to go to graduate school at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And that's my, that was my selection. And I ended up in, a, in an animal lab and studying operant conditioning but I had no idea what behavior analysis was about in those days. You know, in fact, I was studying cognitive psychology. My master's degree advisor, same as my PhD advisor, was Dr. Gordon Pitts, and it was math models. It was cognitive psychology. And I did my thesis <coughs> and my dissertation in that field. But during my, in my junior year, I got an opportunity to visit Anna State Hospital. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I visited the lab of Nate Azrin. <clears throat> and I also met, met uh, Ted Ione while I was there. And it so appealed to me. Um, many of your listeners realize who these folks were. You know, in those days, Nate Azrin was doing work on pain elicited aggression. He was shocking a rat and a cat, and the rat would attack the cat, you know? Um, and, but he was also showing me the token economy that they had set up at Anna State Hospital with, with Ted Ione. So, and that's in the back of my head, because remember, I want to make a difference. And I was thinking, you know, cognitive psychology is fun, and I can publish in these, in these academic journals, but Am I making a difference? For me, I was wondering. But I 
graduated and I got my first job at Virginia Tech, where I am now, 50 years ago. And I was hired as a cognitive psychology. I was hired to teach learning, to teach um, personality, to teach cognitive psychology. In fact, seven years, I did work on reaction time to study cognitions with reaction time being the dependent measure got tenure with that research. But also in those days, starting about 1970, I started the con concern about, am I making a difference? And in those days, we started to do research on litter control and recycling. And I remember those days at Anna State Hospital and how we can use consequences to manage behavior. And it occurred to me, could we use consequences to manage recycling, to reduce littering. And indeed, that's what we did. One of the first papers I ever presented in 1971 was on litter control, you know, at the Applied Behavior Analysis Conference. And I was so excited by the attention I was getting. It was kind of like, what a new kind of thing that I'm actually talking about people who want to apply these techniques in the field to preserve the environment. In fact, in those days, I was, I was communicating with Dr. Richard Winnett, and um, we ended up co-authoring a book called Preserving the Environment. It was published in 1982. And, and during that time, however, there was no research funds available for that kind of stuff. I mean, and I started to wonder about promoting safety. And in the early 80s, we were trying to get people to wear safety belts. Folks, they're not seat belts. <laughs> Watch your language, they're safety belts. And, but in those days, they were lap belts. We could call them seat belts in those days. But today, it's a three-point system. It's a safety device to save lives. We should call them life belts. But we set up programs in the community of Blacksburg to get people to buckle up positive consequences. People would drive their car through the driving, driving window for restaurants and banks, and they would get a bingo number to play Belts Bingo. And every, if they were buckled up, they get a bingo number. So we had a simple contingency that you get to play Belts Bingo and win prizes donated by the community if you were buckled up. So all of a sudden, we course collected the data. I might tell you the reason I get in, got into that research was because I could record that data. I could send my researchers out to the field and they could measure how many people are buckled up during baseline and then during intervention. So we had a clear indication of the impact of our intervention. Indeed, we increased safety belt use in the town of Blacksburg from 20% to over 50% with this community-wide approach. Then one day I got a phone call from Dale Gray. Dale Gray at the time was the safety director of Ford Motor Company. This was about 1980 and he called me up and he said, Scott, I'm hearing about your work. I should also say that the government was listening and we got some research grants. They just not believe that I can control, influence, transportation behavior with positive consequences. It's always passed a law and enforce it. It's all negative consequences. So they were intrigued and we got some research funds. But Dale Gray called me and said, hey, Scott, can you come and help us at Ford Motor Company? We have to get our people wearing safety belts. In fact, we have to get the public buckled up because if we don't get them wearing safety belts, we're gonna have to put airbags in cars. And, and when we put airbags in cars, that's going to cause a crash. Some people will be injured. We can't guarantee that the airbag is always going to be safe with no side effects. So I did travel forward wide to their companies, 313 different facilities at the time, and taught their employees how to implement and a behavior analysis, I call it behavioral science. I call it the application of 
behavioral consequences to get people to buckle up. Positive consequences. Is it an interesting the word consequence and a negative connotation? Consequence can be positive. Of course, we all know that, but the world doesn't get it. Anyway, we increased safety belt use four wide to above 50%. And Dale Gray documented at least 200 lives were saved because employees were in crashes. And if they had not been buckled up, it might have been a fatality. So that's, that, that was the inroad to, to getting me for, go from the environmental to safety. And then we noted the term, we came up with the term in 1979, we called it behavior-based safety. Behavior-based safety. And I started to go to safety conferences. Dale Gray, in fact, got me to be a keynote speaker at the um, Association for, um, what am I trying to say? Um, the, the, um, it's AA, uh, the American Society of Safety Engineers. There we go. I'm, I'm having some difficulty with retrieval these days as I age. But the American Association of Safety Engineers, by the way, I went to those conferences and I sat on my seat and I listened to these people and I'm saying, what are they saying? Think safety. They actually set up contingencies that if you didn't have an injury, if you didn't report an injury, I should say, you get a prize. And so, in fact, if your group did not report an injury, the group gets a prize. So now we put pressure on individuals not to report their injuries, which is exactly what we don't want. So behavior-based safety took off. I started a company with, with several of my PhD students called Safety Performance Solutions. It exists today, but let me tell you, I know nothing about marketing. I don't know how to take this to the real world. You know, I don't know how to disseminate well so the public gets it. So the marketers took it. No, the, the pop psychology, this, this became big. Behavior-based safety became big. And I got concerned and I said, wait a minute, they're not doing it right because they really don't know psychological science. By the way, that's what I'm calling it these days, psychological science. Okay. And so I changed it to people-based safety. That's the term I started to use, wrote two books on people-based safety. Today, I might say, I'm calling it actively caring for people. But let me backtrack. Let me, let me get back to, it was 1989, and I got a phone call from two of my close colleagues, John Bailey and Brian Iwata. And John Bailey was the current editor of JABBA, and Brian Iwata had be the, was the former editor of JABBA. And they said to me, they said, Scott, how would you like to be the next editor of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis? And I said, well, I don't know. I never thought about that. And they said, look, look, our science is getting, is narrow. And you have demonstrated through your work in the environment and your work with safety that we can get beyond the clinic. We can do more than working with developmental disabilities. We think if you became editor of JABA, you could help us move the field beyond, you know, the narrow focus it seems to have. So I did, you know, 1989 until 1992. And I, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of those three years. Um, because what I started to do is first, I wrote an editorial for each issue. And I indeed tried to bring behavior analysis beyond the clinic. In fact, we had special issues. We had a special issue on transportation safety, where I would write, in those days, I was writing three page editorials about the issue, introducing the issue, which by the way, is not done that much these days. But, and then the whole issue, with this particular issue was on traffic safety. Then, we had another special issue on social validity. And again, when I say a special issue, I mean, we got people, I, I contacted people to write articles on the topic of social validity. Not only research articles, but commentary about that. We had a special one on education. We had a special one on 
using behavior analysis to improve education in schools and industry. And again, the whole issue was dedicated to that topic. So again, you can see that I tried to bring it beyond the narrow focus that behavior analysis seemed to have. Then we had a special issue on organizational behavior management. I remember the title, where's the performance in organizational behavior management? And that was 1991. And that year I featured a picture of W. Edwards Deming who had passed away that year. And I might tell you that W. Edwards Deming really changed my perspective, my paradigm. I mean, yeah, I've been raised, I started in cognitive and then I was really into behavior analysis. I like the term behavioral science because that's what we are. We're scientists applying principles to improve behavior. But then I went to a four day seminar that W. Edward Deming gave 1991 was, by the way, he, yes, he passed away in 93. So it was 91 when I went to that seminar and I featured his picture and a story in that issue of Java. Why? Because he was talking about humanism. He, he was humanistic. And although I didn't buy all of his stories and all of his principles, there were select principles within humanism that I realized need to be applied to behavior analysis, to make us more effective, to take us beyond the laboratory, beyond the clinic to the real world. And from then, we had a special issue on organizational behavior management. And I, I went on, my, I'm proud of the fact that we had special issues. And by the way, these special issues re resulted in separate monographs that were distributed, separate from the journal in those days, one on social validity, one on transportation safety. We had one on behavioral community psychology. Again, notice how it's taking behavior analysis beyond the clinic to the real world. And we had one on organizational behavior management. We also had one, one on, uh, the title was, I, I, I got it here, um, on science theory and technology. And the topic was, is applied behavior analysis, analysis technological to a fault? I mean, where's the theory? Do we need theory? And we had special articles by Steve Hayes and John Bailey, Brian Iwata, you know, on that particular issue of are we overly technological and are we missing some theory? And of course, this does relate to my concern or my focus later on humanism, because there is some theory, there are principles within humanism that I think us behaviorists need to adopt to bring our science bigger and better to the real world. So that's kind of like, you know, I, like I say, I, I was gonna be a doctor and then I realized I got in, in, into psychology and then I started in cognitive psychology and then I wasn't making a difference. And in fact, even in behavioral psychology, my focus has been Am I making the kind of difference in the world that I would like to make? And now my whole perspective is, are we as behavioral scientists, as we know how to improve behavior? Notice I don't say change behavior. That's a turnoff. In fact, we still have a journal called Behavior Modification. I learned the hard way that that's a turnoff. In fact, I worked on death row in the prisons, tried to apply contingency management, that's what we called it, to improve behavior in prisons and realized that even inmates heard some of these words like behavior modification, you know, you're not gonna modify my behavior. So realizing that we have to bring some of the humanistic language into our science, it's just language. We still can follow the same principles, although there are principles in humanism that I think we have to respect, like empathy, like empathy, like how about the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Many schools, many textbooks still talk about self-actualization as the top. 
not realizing that Abraham Maslow, before he passed away in 1970, said he was wrong. The top of that ladder is self-transcendence. We call it actively caring, going beyond yourself for somebody else. And I think that's what behavior analysts do. We do that, but we don't necessarily talk about it in the language that other people listen and say, wow, I want some of that. Well, and I think that this is something too that I've noticed when, you know, talking about how people got into the field of behavior analysis or behavioral science. A lot of them didn't start in behavioral science. They started, I mean, you know, it wasn't a major back in yes. the 60s, 70s, 80s. I mean, depending on where you go, the 90s. And they started in this they started in psychology or cognitive or clinical psychology and to kind of hear how you got into you know you finished your master's and your PhD at SIU Carbondale and then got your job at Virginia Tech and then you're like hey wait I remember some of this stuff that you know because you brought up Azrin and I'm like I know exactly the publications and the experience those experiments that you're talking about because I, I mean I studied those yes and it's really neat to hear that you know it I mean it took you even after a lot of your you know your formal training if we want to call it that in school to really start saying hey this could really work in fact Shauna at SIU Carbondale, the Department of Psychology, they didn't have a course in behavior analysis. They did, they, I had the, when I came back from Anna State, in the rehab department at, at SIU, where Beth Salser Azareth was there, they had behavior analysis, but not in psychology. And so I had to learn it going away from the psychology department. I'd come back from Anna State and I'd talk to my advisor and he said, so did you just learn a different way to, to apply positive reinforcement? I mean, they had this, this very narrow perspective with regard to applied behavior analysis. And so, yeah, sometimes you have to kind of go with the flow, the flow for you. You know, it's kind of like you find your purpose, what works for you. And sometimes you have to, get beyond the boundaries of where you are. And I think that that's a really big key thing is getting beyond the boundaries as well, because on a lot of, you know, the social media sites now and a lot of the behavior analysis groups that are up there, you see these, you see individuals coming up and talk, talking and asking all the time, like, hey, this is my history, but I'm really interested in the field of behavioral science is that something that i can still get into i'm in my 40s can i go back to school for that yes and it's like granted you were not in your 40s but um but still case in point that you're i mean you're showing them that just because your formal academic training was in this that doesn't necessarily mean you can't you know switch up your focus and really start and completely change it up. I mean, if you think about where behavior-based safety is now, and I mean, you know, to hear that you were one of the founders of behavior-based safety is so, like, it's so amazing to me to kind of see where it started. And if you look at my career, for example, I started in cognitive, you know, and then I was, editor of JABA. And then I gave up my editorship at the age of 50. And that's when I realized the value of humanism, connecting it to behaviorism. And I must tell you, I've given some keynote addresses at, at ABBA conferences. And I look at the old timers like me, when I'm talking about humanistic behaviorism, and they got their arms crossed and they don't want to listen because they know that some of the principles of humanism just doesn't fit their mindset. But I'm not talking about all the principles. I think sometimes we have to be open to some other principles, some other ideas. And I also think that 
But life is continuous learning. You know, be open to continuously learn and improve. Really, that's, that's what science is about, you know? And so, again, I, I tell my students, find your purpose, but it can change with time as you move on. I look at my life, for example, and I really believe that everything has kind of gone along until now I've ended up with AC4P, actively caring for people, which I think is humanistic behaviorism. And if you think of the word actively caring, active is behavior and caring is humanism. And by the way, B.F. Skinner said in the 70s, behaviorism is the way to make humanism more effective. I, I, really, I buy that, but I am saying that, hum, that humanism is the way to make behaviorism more effective. The point is, it's humanistic behaviorism. And that was a popular term in the 70s, I might say. People were talking about humanism and behaviorism and, and how the two could, could collaborate, but then it kind of dropped away. And I think we need to bring it back. I need, we need to bring it back, basic concepts of humanism and demonstrate how our science of improving behavior can improve human welfare, of course, on a larger scale beyond the clinic if we, be, if we accept and follow some of the principles of humanism. Yeah, and I can't agree more. And I think I might be, this might be wrong, but I think it might have been in a couple like just within the last couple years there was a it was java and they were talking about language and our language and you brought this up and this comes up again when you bring up humanistic behaviorism because a lot of behavior behavioral science language is not necessarily approachable like you have mentioned so far mm -hmm. and it's also a lot of times the words that we use already have this established definition that the general public is is used to and when we say when we say that word meaning something different it doesn't always come off that way and i think that's a really big thing and ronnie dietrich i remember his his commentary about this as well as pretty specifically and how he brought up the same stuff that you're bringing up as well is that you know you came what your goal was was to how can you make the most change and be the most effective as possible and you've really tailored your career to not only you know producing all of these results that you can see in your cv and all of the jobs that you've had the consulting um, research everything like that but also with you know the students that you've taught and you're teaching them the same thing and it kind of goes into that dissemination as well where you know we're we're continuously developing and taking professional development to make sure we're getting better and you know what i've learned perhaps the hard way that that you have to go to the area where you want to make a difference like for example in the safety field I had to start going to safety conferences and I had to start writing for safety magazines. In fact, for 19 consecutive years, I wrote an article every month for industrial safety and hygiene news in a column called the psychology of safety. Now I didn't call it behavior analysis. I, I made it broader, the psychology of safety, but clearly in those articles, I brought in our basic principles of, of behavior analysis or I call it behavioral science but the point is I had to go to those conferences and then I ended up being a keynote speaker at those conferences I might say that my academic world here I don't get a lot of credit for doing that but it's not about credit for the academic world it's credit for making a difference in the real world and that's that's what I've learned you have to do you have to go to the target area that can use your science and for me, it, it started out with the environment and then I, I moved to the safety. And as you know, yeah, people-based safety or behavior-based safety became big. Um, they misused it. You know, the, 
they didn't know any better. You know, we can't blame them. If you, you can be unconsciously incompetent. And they don't, and there is still, and I did learn, however, that marketing is everything. Profound knowledge doesn't work without marketing. I mean, so I've seen these, these banners and this marketing for safety. I didn't ever, it blew me away when I go to these safety conferences and I'd see these people putting up their banners and frankly teaching not necessarily wrong stuff, but incomplete stuff about the science of behavior. So our, my point is to make a difference beyond the clinic, we have to go to those places beyond the clinic. And sometimes we have to sacrifice some of our academic credit. I mean, you know, we write articles in these professional journals and who reads them? Other professionals, you know, but I, and that's fine and that's good. But I also realized that the real world, they read something else. And so we need to translate our science into articles and, and speeches and presentations that the real world can get. You know, one of my biggest thrills was, gosh, it's eight years ago now, when I gave a, a TEDx talk, you know? And I didn't know it was, you know, you get this opportunity to give a 15 minute talk and whatever you, what you, whatever you select. And so I selected to do a topic on self-motivation. Notice that's a humanistic theory. Self-determination theory is humanism. But I took that self-determination theory and I combined it with behavioral science and gave this 15 minute talk. And to my surprise, today I'm proud to say I have over 9 million views of this 15 minute presentation. And I get emailed all over the world, you know, about would you be my mentor? And I do get some negative comments, you know, but mostly positive. But my point is, as a teacher, that's what I want. As a teacher who wants to make a difference, we have to do those kinds of things that reach the real world, even though I don't approve social media, but we have to use social media if we can to make a difference. And I must tell you that that 15 minute talk, I worked hard on that. There are no, there's no PowerPoint. It's 15 minutes with this story and to try to relate humanism with behaviors. And indeed, of course, I referenced B.F. Skinner. And I, 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 very, I might say that not that many TED Talks reference science, but I did. And I'm proud to say that I did. And again, that's just another way to reach the world with what we know. And I just like to mention in that as well that in your TED talk, it's a very it's a very good TED talk, by the way, but it kind of brings up one of your hobbies as well that I would like to mention about you <laughs> is that you're an avid drummer and music lover as well. And in your TED talk, you will get to see you play a drum. And so I also think that that is a very fun and unique aspect to your TED Talk. Not only did you, I really enjoyed talking about, you know, the four C's and bringing the science into it and things like that, but you really kind of, you really showed your human self, not just as a science practitioner, but really you kind of, you made yourself more relatable. And I think that that ties back into what you were just mentioning about yeah, it's not always about the academic career because, you know, everybody who is really reading the journals are other professionals. It's really about making yourself more human and more relatable to individuals who are going to be reading or watching that. Oh, thank you, Shauna. Well, you know, I started playing drums at the age of 10, 10 years old, and, and I did learn the right way to play the drums. Now people don't even hold their drumsticks correctly, but I learned. and. And I, yes, I became a rock and roll drummer. And I might tell you that I'm, I'm pretty much an introvert. I, I I'm pretty, was pretty shy. But playing the drums gave me an opportunity to use, in the back of the band, many, I played with many bands. And I felt part of the crowd, but yet I could still be an introvert, you know? And, you know, um, doesn't mean that introverts can't interact effectively with other people, but it just means that they're, they, their, their inclination is to, is to be, them, be by themselves at times, you know. I probably couldn't have written as many books if I wasn't an introvert, um, staying away from the parties and, and writing. 
But anyway, thank you for recognizing that. Yeah, that took me, that brought me through school. Again, to have something else, something else to take you, your mind off the studies. But when I would go and play, play the Peppermint Lounge in, in Cleveland, Ohio, for example, during the breaks, I would take my books with me because I, would, I, would, I was constantly wanting to study at the same time, participate in a rock and roll band. Well, I can definitely relate to that introvert, the introvert aspect of yourself. Um, yes, I do have this podcast for, you know, the company I work for, but I am also very much so an introvert as well. After I give a lecture, and I've been lecturing introductory psychology about 500 to 600 students in the classroom, and I'm bouncing around the stage and screaming and shouting, and, and when, I, when I tell them I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert, they say, what? And they come up and say, what, you, you can't? I said, well, yeah, because this is a performance. Like, we are performing now. But if we also choose to be alone and do stuff on our, by ourselves, or we might simply say that we're not as likely to go out and approach a stranger and interact. And let me also say with regard to introvert, extrovert, and regard to actively caring, let me talk about these wristbands on my wrist. How about that, Shauna? I have two wristbands on my wrist, <clears throat> and the green wristband says actively caring for people. And this wristband has its own identification number on it. By the way, this, this started after our tragedy at Virginia Tech, April 16th, 2007. Perhaps some of you recall that terrible time when, when 32, faculty and students were shot by another student. <clears throat> anyway, we said, you know, we need to develop a world of actively caring. So this, here's a green wristband. Now, I give this wristband, when I see an act of kindness, I give it to somebody. And I thank them for their act of kindness. And I tell them to wear this wristband and actually report the number at the website website, AC4P, ActivelyCaringForPeople.org. Go to that website and report this number, okay? And then, guess what? Don't keep this wristband. When you see an act of kindness from somebody else, take it off and give it to them and tell them the story. And now we're going to pass on acts of kindness, rewarding acts of kindness, okay? Now, I might say that that this, this is an ongoing process. There are thousands of students, thousands of stories at that website about acts of kindness. And I'm wearing a blue wristband, and I wanna show this. This is for police officers. So we've written a book on actively caring for people policing. And when a police officer sees an act of kindness, and we got in three states now, they are actually doing this. They take off the wristband, give it to a citizen, tell them about the number, and they go and report this act of kindness at their website, activelycaringforpeoplepolicing.org. Now, the process is summarized by the, by the acronym or the, the term STEP, S-T-E-P. See an act of kindness, S. Reward that act of kindness with a wristband. Notice, by the way, I'm not saying reinforcement. I do dislike misuse of the word positive reinforcement. It's only positive reinforcement if it increases the behavior it follows. You all know that. So I, I must say I do like to use the appropriate technologies, but it's a reward, okay? And T, C, T, thank them for their act of kindness, E of step, enter the wristband number at the website. And guess what? You can check this wristband number and you can follow it from where you first gave it out across the country, across the world. These wristbands are showing up in South Africa. In fact, they have a, their own website down in South Africa where they promote actively caring for people. And then the P of step, of course, pass it on. I must tell you that when a citizen, we've learned this, when a citizen gets a blue wristband from a police officer, they don't want to pass it on. 
they want to keep this wristband. They're proud of this. I got this from Officer Bentley, man. I'm, I'm going to keep this. And again, you can buy wristbands. We have them in child sizes and adult sizes. You can buy them at the website. And I might say, too, we've published research articles where we've reduced bullying in schools. In fact, we have a book, Actively Caring for People in Schools. And we've reduced bullying in schools by setting up a process where step, where students recognize acts of kindness. So the teacher is putting focus on acts of kindness rather than bullying. Well, and I think that that's a really good point as well. And I will, of course, make sure to put the website in the description. So if anybody is interested in visiting the website and looking at the books or buying wristbands to start engaging in this actively caring for people initiative. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thought Leaders. Join us next month as Dr. Geller answers the question, where do you see the field going? And or where would he like to see the field go? And as always, if you have questions, comments, feedback, or suggestions, please feel free to reach out to us at operantinnovations at abatechnologies.com.